All right, we're talking about all of the different uh, questions that are coming in right now for David Daggett with Daggett Schuler Law. All right, so this one says, I have an umbrella policy. Is that a good idea? And how much coverage in an umbrella policy should I have? So an umbrella policy is an insurance policy you purchase that kicks in after the limits of your insurance coverage. So typically, people who are business owners, high net worth people, will have an insurance policy and then an umbrella policy on top of that. Typically, I, what I look at is on making those recommendations mm -hmm. is what kind of assets do you have that you need to protect from a potential claim? What kind of business are you running? And what is your potential exposure? Part of the question is how much should you have? It, it depends on what kind of business you're running and, and uh, depends what your personal exposure could be. So typically, wealthier people tend to have an umbrella policy because their insurance policy coverage may not be enough, be enough. to cover everything. So gotcha. they are typically sold, you typically have to have, in, in uh, auto accidents or homeowner's insurance, you typically have to have a baseline of usually $500,000 in coverage and then you buy an umbrella that kicks in over the top of that. Mm -hmm. You can buy those in denominations of a million dollars, $5 million, $10 million, $25 million. So if you have an expensive business, an expensive property, and you can't afford to pay damages that could happen, you may want to consider getting an umbrella policy. Okay. This person says, my mom was hit by a police officer. It was admittedly his fault, but there haven't been attorneys that were willing to help her because of it being with the police. What are her options? She didn't have life-threatening injuries, but she had to get a loan for another car and hers was paid for. I'm friends with police officers. I've represented lots of police officers. Mm -hmm. We've also represented people with claims against police officers. It's just like any other case. Now there's other loopholes that you may have to jump through. For example, there's areas of immunity if the police officer is in the course and scope of his duty in performing those obligations. So an example of that is a speeding police officer with the lights and siren on going to arrest somebody that is in urgent need of action. Uh -huh the officer may have some immunity in that situation. So the laws can be complicated, but most of the time they're like any other case, we've handled plenty of them and that person deserves compensation, it sounds like. Okay, this person says, my son was assaulted on a school bus. He suffered a concussion and some memory loss. Uh, the DA settled the case, um, but now my son is having more severe memory loss. Is there anything we can do to regain the ongoing medical costs that they were not paid for? That is very similar to our first question about a drunk driver. Mm -hmm. the, the DA didn't, quote, settle the case. What he did is he entered into a plea agreement with the person at fault for the criminal charges that he paid some sort of sentence, a fine or whatever, and it was under the condition that he pay the medical expenses incurred. So now you have to look further and say, was there somebody at fault and can that person at fault for this assault pay anything? Another kid, you can file a lawsuit against another kid, but there, there's nothing to get from the kid. So th that wouldn't be an economically viable option. However, if the parents knew or should have known that this young man was going to assault the other person, the parents could be at fault also, and there could be a potential case. I don't want to make up facts. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. but this you're one's, some this one sounds doubtful, but there are possibilities. Okay. This is kind of off topic, but it says if you want to divorce and you have no idea where your spouse is, how do you find them if they can't be served? <laughs> well, there are several ways to do that. Number one, most people can be found these days. Number two is you can serve them by what's called publication. So there's a statute on service by publication. In the old days, you put it in the newspaper three times over 30 days, and that counts as service. You go down, get your divorce, and it's finalized. So uh, it's a little more complicated than that. But yes, it can be done. It, you serve them by publication or some other manner. Okay, we have about a minute left. Is there a statute of limitation for an injury with an accident? Yes. Most times, the statute of limitations is three years. I always put a caveat on that because there's exceptions. For example, in a wrongful death case, the statute of limitations is shorter. 
In a medical malpractice case, it could be extended longer based on the circumstances. Additionally, you throw in for a minor child, which is somebody under 18 years old, that statute of limitations may not start to run until they're 18, depending on the facts of the situation. Okay. So typically three years. Typically three years, but not always three <laughs> not years. Not always three years. Okay. Like everything, lawyers make it complicated. <laughs> well, there's complicated things that are yes. going on, right? So what we want to do is we want to put all of this online for you. So maybe you heard something in our conversation over the last half hour, and you're like, I need to hear that again. It's going to be in the two wants to know section of our website.